The Unshackled Waves, episode 150. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Budget week has just passed in Australia with the Turnbull government promising a surplus next year, a staggered income tax cuts and increased spending in aged care, education and infrastructure. Bill Shorten delivered his budget reply speech vowing to block tax cuts for companies and high income earners, with his focus being on tax cuts for low income earners. However, budget week was overshadowed by another twist in the dual citizenship saga with a new high court ruling knocking out Labor Senate Katie Gallagher and four lower house MPs setting up a Super Saturday of by-elections. Internationally, the major event was United States President Donald Trump withdrawing from the Iran nuclear deal, which has already had significant military ramifications in the Middle East. And Hillary Clinton was also in Australia and New Zealand this past week as part of a global victim tour where she still blames fake news and misogyny for election loss. The political class still fawned over her and plenty of gullible people still bought tickets for her show. So to discuss all this, I'm joined by The Unshackled's political editor, Michael Smythe. Michael, good to have you back on the show again. Good to be back here, Tim. Now, it was supposed to be a political week dominated by the federal budget, but the dual citizenship saga burst onto the scene again with another high court uh, ruling. This time it was Labor ACT Senator Katie Gallagher. This was a new ruling by the high court on what constitutes reasonable steps to renounce your citizenship. Uh, It means that if you're a dual citizen at the time of your nomination, then you're ineligible. So this had the effect of knocking out Labor's Susan Lamb, uh, Josh Wilson and Justine Key, and also uh, formerly Nick Xenophon team, but now Centre Alliance MP Rebecca Sharkey. So we're going to have now five uh, by-elections in a Super Saturday in June, uh, including uh, Tim Hammond uh, from Labor, who resigned for uh, family reasons. Mm, mm, that's right. The likelihood of the coalition picking up any of those seats, however, is remote, simply because of the fact that by-elections tend to favour the opposition, even when the opposition party, in this case the Labour Party, has been less than honest with the electors and the electorates of Australia, pertaining especially Susan Lamb and Katie Gallagher. Now, there are two Western Australian uh, by-elections, Perth and Fremantle. They're both uh, safe Labor seats, uh, pretty left uh, progressive ones. So the Liberals have decided not to run, which means that uh, the Greens will get a decent run in, in those seats. Uh, however, uh, Braddon in Tasmania and Longman in uh, northern Brisbane, they're both marginal Labor, which it hasn't been confirmed yet, but uh, the Liberals are looking to have a, a crack there. And uh, there, there was a poll on the weekend that said that the, the Liberals uh, were in front in, in Longman. And a lot of this has to do with One Nation preferences who flowed to Labour last time, but they're going to flow to the, to the Liberals this time. It does seem that way, although it is important to note that the LNP to my knowledge, has not yet selected, or pre-selected rather, a candidate to run. Wyatt Roy was contacted by the Australian and said that he would not be contesting the seat. So far, the front runner was suggested to be Jason Snow, but recently another name was drawn, was um, put out there, uh, Tre- Trevor Rithenberg, who was the former MLA for Kalanga. Uh, during the Campbell Newman landslide of 2012 till the throwing out of the LNP in 2015. It's amazing that Wyatt Roy is only about 28 and he's already fed up uh, with with politics. Hmm. I have no comments about Wyatt because I know him personally, so I will refrain from commenting at this time. 
And the, the seat of Mayo in South Australia, held by Rebecca Sharkey, that's normally a safe uh, liberal seat, but it was won mm. by the then Nick Xenophon team, basically because uh, Jamie Briggs, who was a sitting liberal member, his brand was toxic because uh, he resigned over uh, inappropriate, uh, well, it wasn't relations, but behavior uh, towards mm. a, a diplomat. Uh, overseas and then there was this his, his uh, infamous injury at uh, Tony Abbott's uh, uh, post prime ministership uh, booze up uh, party and so it was pretty much a, a vote against uh, Jamie Briggs there. Uh, there has been talk that uh, Georgina Downer, Alexander Downer's daughter, now she's been trying to gain pre-selection for uh, liberal seat in Victoria for uh, a number of years, but she's sort of been burnt by the, the factional uh, shenanigans that are going on in that, uh, that state. So now she's uh, trying in a home state. Uh, now, a lot of people are saying that uh, she'll you know, do well on the, the downer name uh, based on the performance of her father and grandfather, but um, she's on the news quite a bit. Uh, she uh, works for the IPA. I, I'm not that impressed with her uh, performance. I don't think that, uh, as some commentators are predicting, she'd just be able to, to ride in. Well, that's the thing, Australia doesn't have political dynasties in the same way as the United States of America or even the United Kingdom to a lesser extent. But the power of political branding is such that regardless of how underwhelming she may seem to you and to other people, I actually don't have an opinion on Ms. Downer, to be honest, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting her. But the fact is she will probably have a good run simply because of the fact that she is her father's daughter and the liberal party will look upon that favorably they think oh she's she's down his daughter we should let her run if no one else can be bothered to put their hand up so you'll find that there's a a nostalgia vote that, that will probably kick in during the pre-selection as well it's quite likely that it, it, it's it's the seat of mayo the seat of mayo is usually liberal has almost always been a liberal seat that's always and had the a fact, strong independent vote it has but the independents have generally tended to preference the liberals anyway rather than labor except for 2007 i think it was but i think if she does seek pre-selection she will win she's already being touted by the australian as a front runner so i think it's safe to say that unless someone else puts their hand up for it or Jamie Briggs tries to come back in from the cold, then... <laughs> no, that won't then, happen. Well, I know, but unless that ha unless either of those things happen, Georgina Downer will be the Liberal Party candidate for the seat of Mayo at the next federal election. Oh, I have no doubt she'll be the candidate, but whether she'll win the seat, uh, that's another thing, because despite the Nick Xenophon team, Centre Alliance, whatever it's called now, uh, is uh, on the nose in, in South Australia, as, as Xenophon is out of Parliament. Uh, Rebecca Sharkey, she does have a good uh, local pr profile. She's, uh, she's, she's talked about fondly by the, by the locals there. Uh, they will probably like to keep having a somewhat in independent uh, voice. Maybe maybe like i said there's the whole nostalgia factor as well people do have a propensity towards nostalgia especially if it's all they've known for most of their lives so i think that she could still win um against rebecca it's just a matter of by how much it won't be a convincing victory but it will be a victory i would suspect but uh, then I could be wrong. I was wrong about the South Australian result while being right about Batman, so anything's possible. Now, these uh, five by-elections, including uh, Labor's Tim Hammond, uh, they're, they're, going, or they're being viewed in the, the media as uh, referendums on, the, uh, on both sides' uh, budget uh, proposals. Uh, now, most, mo most of these uh, seats have, are Labor uh, defending them. Uh, so 
Labour would probably be favoured to retain uh, most of these seats. And uh, by-elections, they, they have a history of showing up uh, uh, weird results. So I, I would say that whatever the outcome, we shouldn't take it as a sign of where the general election is going to go because they're always different based on uh, overall uh, campaigns. That's right. As I was saying before, by-elections tend to be a way of allowing people to blow off steam as well. So if they're unhappy with the coalition, for example, and most people have a reason to be unhappy with the coalition, myself included, the people will vent and then they'll vote for Labor. But that won't necessarily remain the case. It's interesting to note in the long run, and I'll have to write an article about this in the next week or two, once we're aware of who all the candidates will be for the electorate of Longman. It's, it'll be interesting to see if there are any other parties that decide to run, because One Nation's already pre-selected a candidate. Uh, the LNP is still deciding. Labor has pre-selected. I don't know if the Greens are going to run. Uh, Catter is not going to run in southeast Queensland anymore. So you may you, there may be an independent or two that could run if they can find the money, but it's at this stage it's probably going to be a race between the the LNP and Labor at this stage. The One Nation vote may cause an influ an influence on the vote to tip the LNP over because Susan Lamb was very critical of One Nation. But a lot of the people on the ground in Longman may not agree with Pauline's reasoning and they may preference Labour anyway, despite what One Nation advises them to do. Judging that we are having these uh, by-elections now and the federal election can be anywhere from August 2018 to May 2019 and Turnbull said he wants to go full term as late as possible, uh, it would be probably a bit much for if the the coalition did well in these by-elections to three three months later uh, go to a, another election after uh, the people in these five seats uh, have just gone so you would assume that the federal election is still going to be a bit of time away well we'd hope so i mean by-elections are expensive by-elections are very expensive and you don't want to be having a by-election in say four or five weeks or so five or six weeks from now rather and then decide you know what we're going to have another general election where they have to go back to the polls anyway but it's it's going to be interesting to see how it turns out because it, you know the labor has everything to lose here the coalition can lose the seats and still hold on to power or they can even things, go go up a couple of seats. They could. It's not likely, but they could. It just depends. It just depends on how good the candidates are on the ground in this case. Because when we will probably talk about this later on during the podcast, but both Labour and the Coalition have been underwhelming in their budgets, in their budget proposals. Short and even more so, but we can get onto that later. But it's just the news poll shows that Turnbull is much more heavily preferred as prime minister than Shorten is. So while people hate the coalition, they hate and they hate Turnbull, they hate Shorten even more. Oh, well, let's turn back to the budget now, and uh, we won't discuss the uh, Turnbull government uh, budget because we did that in our live stream on Tuesday night, so we'll focus on Shorten's uh, budget reply, which was uh, delivered on the Thursday. Uh, now, he's uh, promised he'll deliver a bigger tax cut to uh, low-income earners. He's got the Working Australians tax refund, which will cost uh, $6 billion over four years. Uh, it'll be worth uh, 928 uh, a year and uh, will be applied to 
uh, 10 million uh, working Australians. He's also promised to uh, scrap upfront uh, TAFE fees and he's also going to uncap university places, which is, <laughs> that's going to be a huge disaster. A bad idea. Yeah, as uh, Demi Lardner would say. <laughs> We knew that he was already going to block the company tax cuts. He is reintroducing the debt levy for high income earners, and he's also going to block the, the flat tax proposal, which will come in over the, the seven year period and apply to people earning over 42,000 up to 200,000. Actually, it's interesting. Lee Sales actually gave him some flack about that. You wouldn't expect a journalist at the ABC to give any flack to Labor about blocking a flat tax proposal, and yet, and yet she did. She actually did her job, which was a pleasant surprise. The problems I have, I mean, I, I think I had a rage to you on the phone at some point. I know I had a rage to a couple of other friends um, about how pithy and how pointless Shorten's budget reply seemed to be. They say, you know, it's waffle, 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 my environment. Waffle, 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 atherogenic climate change. Waffle, 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 waffle. We're going to strip away $80 billion in tax concessions and tax breaks from multinationals and big businesses, which actually sounds like a good thing, except that $80 billion is not going to make up for the shortfall in the tax cuts being promised. It's not going to be able to subsidize the extra money that it's not gonna be able to subsidize the extra university places and upfront TAFE costs that they are promising to campaigning, basically campaigning on the promise to scrap the $2.8 billion for hospitals more than they were, would have injected otherwise. And then, and then 25 million for public prosecutors. And of course, refusing to raise the retirement age, which is cynical of them because they're the ones who raised it in the, when Rudd was prime minister. And they, they're also like the coalition. They're also fact. They're also projecting everything based on the world economy as well as Australia's economy remaining in a relatively strong position. What could possibly go wrong? Like I read in my article, what could possibly go wrong? It's a more politically attractive. Uh, budget. I, I I give them that, and they they mm. can reach a surplus at the same time uh, as the the coalition uh, on paper. It'll just be uh, a game of uh, luck, basically. Game of luck and a game of who can cook the books better, Labor or the Liberals. That's what it comes down to at the end of the day. I mean, the amount of forward projections and forward estimates that they've used. I haven't even gone through all the figures yet, and it's just staggering to me how much they have been able to pull the wool over some people's eyes thinking oh this is a great thing it sounds great but when you look at the when you look beneath the surface no it's not a great thing at all and that's what worries me people are going to vote for either the coalition or the labor based on who's going to give them more money well labor has so a bigger pot of money to to play with because uh, as i mentioned they're they're blocking all these uh, tax cuts and raising taxes for the, the higher income earners. But yeah, there's also the, the rules of uh, economics. Uh, I mean, you can't just keep increasing taxes and expect people to be just as productive. Exactly. And company tax, as much as it sounds good to, you know, have businesses pay more or at least as much as individuals, businesses do have a habit of generating jobs generating jobs generates income for people to spend in the shops people earning income have to pay tax so the company tax cuts being blocked might sound good in theory but in reality it could actually be a lot worse remember when tony Abbott came to power in 2013 he said australia is open for business again because he slated economic reforms some of which have helped our current situation so Labor's rhetoric on blocking the company tax cuts it sounds ill-advised to me. And uh, the federal government, they've said they still want to pass uh, their uh, 
scheduled uh, tax cuts what's well, over a seven year period and they've been heavily criticized for this saying well how do you know you're going to be around in in, in seven years i mean uh these people have a point that uh, a budget is only supposed to be for for one year and they're they're trying to play hardball saying we want to pass them uh, as a whole which is and i really hate it when political parties do this it's either all or nothing because it's it's such a uh a, a crass political game it's like well uh we're, we're going to get nothing and blame you for for blocking it even though we could have got some of it passed Mm. Well, that's the nature of um, the politics in regards to budgets. They set traps in budgets for the opposition. So if the opposition ever does come to power, they have to clean up the mess. So, for example, when uh, Chris Bowen claimed in 2014, 2015, that the coalition had actually doubled the debt under Labor, that was technically correct because what they did was they put so much stuff as booby traps and forward estimates that the government realized that the sorry that the coalition government realized oh dear we're in trouble now we actually have to say labor left the economy in a worse position than it was and they did to be fair however because they're the ones realizing you know we've got this extra debt we have to take care of it they're still the ones getting blamed and it's the same when it was the same in 2007 to a lesser extent even though we had a surplus of 20 billion or so we well, sorry the labor party had a few um unpleasant budget expenses that had not been fully accounted for so they had to take care of those as well like the NBN, for example, the NBN was actually a, a proposal thereof. The N it's still the not NBN on the budget. Yeah, well, well, the problem is what we're talking about. The we're talking about the the NBN. It wasn't technically on the budget books in two thousand six, two thousand seven, or two thousand seven, two thousand and eight. That's true, but. It was a cost of promise that Howard wanted to take, although Howard's model was, well, just as bad as the Labor Party's model, to be honest. And then now we've got fibre to the node. So it's like, well, pff, well, wasn't that a waste of time and money and effort and consultancy fees? Um, anyway, my point was that governments of all sides they have this tendency to put booby traps into the budget for when they are no longer in power and then they can point the finger and say you did this you are responsible for this you need to clean it up and and the, and then the other party responds saying no this was your fault you put this in and just becomes a blame game and distracts from the real issues which is this the structural imbalances in the budget, the fact that we have essentially a two-tier economy, and the fact that people are struggling to feed their families and pay their energy bills. The big international news of the week was uh, United States President Donald Trump withdrawing from the Obama-negotiated Iran nuclear deal. Now, this had the effect of uh, unfreezing uh, funds uh, to the Iranian regime, lifted sanctions on Iran in exchange for uh, not developing uh, nuclear weapons. Now, Trump was critical of the deal in his uh, 2016 uh, presidential uh, campaign, but uh, didn't really say whether he would uh, tear it up. Uh, Israel's influence has been key to ending this. Uh, Israel showed Trump a report which showed they, they tried to develop a nuclear bomb before 2003, and uh, for Trump that was proof that uh, the Iranians cannot be trusted. They still sponsor uh, terrorism. Uh, Europe uh, wants the to continue the deal. Uh, but it's worth reflecting at first, uh, was this deal working? No. In short, no, the deal wasn't working because with the unfrozen Iranian funds, they were able to increase their breakout capacity. Iran was able to increase its breakout capacity. And the Israelis actually launched, although they didn't acknowledge that they had done it, they actually launched an attack on the city of Qum, 
I think it was called, I think it was that city, in just after the Iran deal, Iran nuclear deal was first announced by President Obama. And the Iranians didn't respond because they couldn't respond. And the Israelis made some quip about, oh, we could have done it. Well, it probably wasn't us, but we could have done it. Maybe God was striking it down or some made some facetious comment about, you know, acts of God and such. But look, the, the, the Iran nuclear deal didn't work simply because of the fact that Iran was never going to play ball. We didn't need the Israelis to tell us that. The fact is Iran has always been a rogue state, not in the sense of they want to blow everyone up, except for Israel, because, you know, Ahmadinejad hates Israel and so do the Ayatollahs. But they've always been a rogue state. They've always done things their way ever since the revolution. I mean, they held several Americans and other Westerners in their embassy for almost a year after the revolution. So, no, you can't trust Iran, ever. It's that simple. The, the interesting thing that was overlooked in regards to the Iranian nuclear deal, and I don't know if this was Obama trying to covertly destabilize the regime. There was a, an Iranian terrorist organization that existed that was taken off the blacklist of um, terrorist organizations that the Americans and the CIA have. Uh, that group that was taken off, I forget their name, I need to look it up, but they were actually the socialist faction that teamed up with the Ayatollahs to overthrow the Shah in 79 before um, before the Ayatollahs turned on the socialists and had them all killed or expelled from Iran. The reason... I, I don't get why Europe wants to keep the deal, though. This is what bugs me. Why would Europe want to keep the deal? Are the European banks making money off the Iranian sanctions? Oh, sorry, the freezing of Iranian sanctions and the availability of funds? You've got to wonder why they want it. I mean, there's going to be this the sad reality, Tim, is that there's going to be a war eventually anyway. And the closer Iran gets to uh, break our capacity, and they are nearly there now, the more likely it is that there's going to be a massive death toll for the mixed world war whenever that happens. Well, there's already been uh, co uh, consequences uh, following Trump's withdrawal of the deal. Now, uh, Iran had been assisting the Assad regime in Syria with uh, uh, weapons, and Israel, uh, they want Assad uh, gone. So uh, rockets have been fired into uh, Israeli-held territories uh, by Iran, and Israel has responded by uh, firing rockets uh, back into Syria. Uh, now, uh, White House uh, Press Secretary uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders said that Iran's actions here vindicated uh, Trump's decision. There's been uh, protests uh, both in the Iranian parliament and on the streets, the, the, the common chant of uh, death to America has uh, uh, returned uh, again. So yeah, they're, the Iranians, they're, they're, they're not taking this lying down. No, but they've always had that mentality. You've got to remember as well, Tim, that the Shia, Shia Iran is very different from Sunni Saudi Arabia. The Shiites are essentially a minority in, in the Islamic world. I mean, you've got Iran, you have Syria, and you have Iraq, who are basically the only Shia, oh, well, Lebanon as well. Technically, you could argue that Lebanon is also a Shiite oh, well, majority. Oh, Hezbollah is. Oh, Hezbollah is definitely Shiite. Um, is definitely part of the Shiite schism from Sunni Islam or whatever. Or Sunni is a schism from Shia, whatever you want to argue. Point is, the Shia Muslims look to Iran for leadership. The Sunni Muslims look to Saudi Arabia for leadership. And Saudi Arabia is an American ally. So the reason why the Israelis 
or Little Satan, as the Iranians call them, is tolerant of Saudi Arabia, but not so tolerant of Iran, is because of the alliance of Riyadh with Washington, D.C., with the United States of America, called the Great Satan by the Iranians, especially the Ayatollahs. The attacks by Iran on Israeli infrastructure in the Golan Heights, which has been a heavily contested area of that region for decades, has it doesn't surprise me one bit. It doesn't surprise me either that Israel wants to retaliate and does retaliate. What surprises me is that Israel wants Assad gone. I mean, yes, you can argue, yes, Assad is possibly an Iranian puppet, but at the same time, he is much less likely to attack Israel, uh, barring the usual, you know, scuffles over the Golan Heights, than, say, uh, Egypt or the Palestinian Authority, whatever's left of it. And even Lebanon, for that matter. Um, Hezbollah is in power in Lebanon now. So you look at it and think, hmm... Yeah, that could be interesting. Uh, now, is this another one of uh, Trump's uh, famous uh, 5G chess moves? And uh, I saw this funny meme on the internet saying that uh, uh, Trump, uh, through his uh, uh, methods that he, <laughs> that he's using to uh, deal with uh, world leaders, is actually achieving what the, the Miss USA uh, beauty pageant contestants want, which is world peace, because uh, through his <laughs> uh, heavy-handedness with North Korea, he's uh, he's kickstarted a peace process, and uh, could uh, could the, the same happen with uh, Iran? Because you have to remember there that the the young people of Iran they hate. Uh, their regime. I mean, there's there, there were protests uh, during the Arab Spring against the uh, Islamic uh, regime, and there were, uh, I think, it was last year also another round of uh, protests as well. Now, the the main outcome that that I want to, want to see with Iran is for Persia to to rise again. The, these young people <laughs> who, who who basically uh, because. Uh, there's there's not as much censorship as in other totalitarian regimes, and so the the West is beamed into Iran, and these young people they want that uh, Western uh, lifestyle, and so is that is my dream achievable? Do you think? I think we would like it to be, but I don't think it is, Tim. Um, the interesting thing, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. The interesting thing about Iran and Iranians. Iran converted to Islam very late compared to most other areas of the Islamic world, except for Indonesia and Malaysia. The Iranians, the Persians of today, they have never forgotten that they are Iranian first and Muslim second. So they still have their pride in their culture, their pre-Islamic culture, they still have that pride. Um, yes, they will protest against the Ayatollahs, not because necessarily they want the Ayatollahs gone. Some of them would, but that's not the reason why they protest. The, the elections that they have, the candidates are handpicked by the Ayatollahs. The reason, one of the reasons why they protest is because a moderate candidate was disqualified from the election and he was the more popular of the moderate candidates and that's why they were protesting um so they put in rahani rahani instead i think that was rahani was his name i think rahani yeah they put in rahani instead he's nominally a moderate but you know he's still kowtows to the hardliners in the regime like Khamenei and the what's the council called there's a council for it called the, the council of ayatollahs they still wield the supreme power with the supreme leader Khamenei. So, yeah. So, in answer to your question, uh, Persia, as we envisaged it, will not be able to rise again, sadly. But the people will still remember, and at a cultural and unconscious level, who they are and what they are and what they used to be. 
can the Iranian regime get overthrown by people power? Probably not, because if that were the case, it would have happened already. And I would actually go as far as to venture and venture an unpopular opinion and say that it's actually better for Iran to stay the way it is as a buffer to Saudi-led Sunni Islam. That's an interesting conclusion uh, there. Remember as well, the Iranians look down on the Arabs. Yeah, the Iranians they're not Arabs. Never forgiven. Uh, Arabians. Exactly. That's exactly right. They're technically Aryans. Um, one of the Shah's titles was actually Light of the Aryans back in the day, when, before he was deposed. Um, the Iranians look down on the Arabs, not just because they're different, but because also they see the Arabs as being... How do I put this politely? Actually, I can't put it politely, you but can say suffice it. it to say... <laughs> now, they look, they look down on the Arabs as slaves, because the, what did the Arabs have? Before Muhammad came along and unified them into a militaristic death cult with an ideology that makes communism look almost tame by comparison. The Iranians had built, the Persians rather, had built an empire that challenged Greece and Rome and we even stretched into India and had contact with China. What do the Arabs do? Sit around in their deserts, in their little tents and, you know, in, engage in raids against the other parties? They basically, they basically had nothing. That's why the Iranians looked down on them. All of the Islamic science they stole from Persia and India. Now, Australia had a special guest uh, here uh, this past week. Uh, Hillary Clinton uh, spoke in events at Sydney and Melbourne. Now, thankfully, she didn't receive the the, the mania that uh, comes with a, a royal visit. Uh, most Australians have got better things to do. Uh, while she was in New Zealand, she scored uh, 5.5 million of New Zealand taxpayer funds for the Clinton Foundation, which as we know, uh, has uh, accepted money from uh, shady sources and also expended it in a shady uh, manner. Now, uh, while she was in Australia, Hillary Clinton met with Julie Bishop. Uh, as far as we know, Julie Bishop didn't write out a check, thank God. Um, Hillary Clinton also met with uh, Bill Shorten and Chloe Shorten and also met with uh, Daniel Andrews. Now, her speaking events here were in conversation with uh, Julia Gillard. Uh, now, the thing they both have in common is they blame misogyny for their downfall uh, and they also uh, complained about all the time they have to do hair, makeup and clothes when they're, when they're campaigning and probably what I felt found most alarming about their conversation is they uh, lamented that we have too much free speech in, a, in Australia uh, which and in the United States, yeah. which allows so-called fake news about them to spread. <laughs> the fake news meme was started by Trump, and now they're hijacking and claiming as their own. No, it the was actually with... it was actually Hillary Clinton who first spoke about fake news, and then uh, Trump and the rest of us we owned it, saying, "Well, you know, the mainstream media is fake news." So we turned it into a meme. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we turned it into a meme, but it came originally from Hillary. Mm, yeah. Actually, now that you mention, actually now that you mention that, that sounds about right. Oh, well, she probably called. She probably called reports of what's going on and what's not going on in Haiti, fake news. Anyway, that's just an aside, as we were talking about before. The problem with Gillard and Clinton is that they seem to have a pathological inability to accept responsibility for their actions they have this pathological inability to recognize that people dislike them for reasons other than their gender and yes i did just assume their gender tim sue me um it's it's just come on we don't i didn't hate gillard because she was a woman i don't hate gillard because she's a woman i don't care if she was a man i'd hate her just the same if she was a member of the Liberal Party and acted in the way she did, I would hate her just the same. Same with any other political party. I would hate her just the same. It's not about gender. We don't hate people because of gender. We hate people because they're despicable, unlikable, pathologically dishonest in the case of both Clinton and Gillard. I don't think I can 
emphasize that enough. Uh, uh, Gillard, uh, she complained again about being called a, a witch, and uh, Clinton complained about the, the locker-up chants. And they, they try and make out that uh, criticism of them is unique to women, but uh, consider their opponents. I mean, Tony Abbott and Donald Trump, you had columnists who wrote openly calling for their assassination. I mean, that's that's much more mm -hmm. violent and vitriolic than uh, what was said about them. Exactly. I mean, I don't know of anyone who's ever called for an assassination of Gillard or Clinton. And, you know, I would never condone that. As much as I despise them, I would never condone that. Even if I did hear it, and I would disavow it instantly. I mean, we all would. Any reasonable, decent human being would disavow such a thing. You don't use violence as a as a dog whistle to you know figuratively bash up political opponents that's just not civilized that's just not the way we do things here well i i would say uh politicians in general i mean vitriolic and violent stuff is said about all of that i i mean that's what you sign up for when you're uh, a politician if like you, you get your feelings hurt by uh being called a witch you should probably do something else <laughs> yeah it's yeah i have to admit i'm surprised that gillard took such exception to that i mean it's probably crocodile tears probably confected outrage that she felt as opposed to clinton who probably is a witch but you never know actually edit that part out um Point is, start again. There is a lot of confected outrage that Gillard had regarding um, being called a witch, being you know so uppity with Tony Abbott when he admittedly, you very admittedly paraphrased Aaron um, Alan Jones rather oh yes the died of shame comment yeah i mean that was a yeah i mean that was alan jones comment and then tony abbott paraphrased and said you know this government should die of shame and that triggered her yeah but the thing is, is she knew she had to have known was coming the fact that well she used to be a lawyer so she's not exactly an idiot she knew exactly how to turn that back on Abbott and, you know, slam him for it. And then he looks at his watch, just like, you done yet? And it's like, oh, there's another man just looking at his watch. Ree! But funny thing is, um, what's his name? The Indian Prime Minister of Full Modi, Manmohan Singh, he... And they remember that time when Gillard went to India and tripped over Gandhi's yeah. tomb? Yeah, that was funny. And then she gave a speech, and um, Manmohan Singh was looking at his watch, and you could see him looking at his watch too. And she didn't notice that he was looking at his watch. She was thinking, oh, when you call him out for misogyny. Ooh. I'm sorry. I, I just, I, I still despise Gillard. But I would never, I would never, ever, ever do what some left wing and all progressive pundits did in regards to Tony Abbott and Donald Trump and Nigel Farage for that matter. There was actually uh, a car accident, to put it politely, in regards to Nigel Farage where he was injured. So there are some messed up people out there, Tim. There was still uh, lots of people who were willing to, to pay to see her to, to make this tour uh, viable. Uh, well, it was $195 for a basic uh, ticket, so... That's a I lot of money! Yeah. Uh, I, I, it would never be worth... I, I wouldn't even go for free. No, I wouldn't go for free either. I mean, I might go to heckle, but... Nah. Even uh, even then, I couldn't be bothered. Even just to heckle. You'd, ha you'd, have, you'd have to pay me a lot of money. You'd have to pay me a lot of money for me to want to go to one of those events with two absolutely toxic narcissists such as Gillard and Clinton. As I mentioned earlier, I mean, the fact that the political class, they're, they're still uh, fawning over her. I mean, yeah, Julie Bishop, who, well, 
know, she's supposed to be a liberal. I mean, I, I hope there would have been a few uh, conservative liberals who would have like rung her up and saying, why are you meeting with this uh, you know, corrupt woman? Uh, we, uh, we pretty much expect the same from Shorten and Andrews. Uh, Shorten calling Clinton an inspiration to women. Uh, and there was a good um, uh, Facebook post by Mark Latham saying that uh, uh, Gillard and Clinton, they had no no issue uh, uh, having their careers advanced by uh, men or the, the patriarchy. Let, let, let's not forget that uh, Hillary Clinton, she rode <laughs> off the back of her um, much more charismatic uh, husband uh, to, mm. to get where she is. So I'm not sure how that's a valuable lesson to young girls. Just, just marry a uh, charismatic man and you'll be able to make it. There, Latham, Mark Latham's right to point out the rank hypocrisy of um, Gillard and Clinton in this case in particular for, you know, slamming the patriarchy when she was able to use it to advance her position and go from there to become Secretary of State and candidate for yeah. president. She was a sen you know, senator for eight years as well. Mm, that's right. And that's how she was able to springboard into a presidential race, which she thankfully lost to Barack Obama, even though I don't like Obama either because I don't trust him. I'm glad it was him who won the Democratic primary and not Hillary. And then she ran again in 2016 with Obama's blessing, apparent blessing. And she probably should funny. have lost to Bernie Sanders if it was a fair contest. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, they rigged it. I mean, what was it? Debbie Wasserman Schultz actually said, yeah, we might have changed registration slightly or something along those lines. Basically conceding that they had rigged it against Bernie Sanders. The thing is, if Bernie Sanders had been the candidate, yes, he'd be the old, one of the oldest presidents ever elected in American history, but he probably would have beaten Trump. Mm -hmm. Because the reason why Trump won is because people were sick and tired of the same old, same old. Be in the pocket of the big end of town, get paid for speeches to Goldman Sachs and the Council for Foreign Relations. And, you know, Trump, well, obviously Trump is not necessarily the most likable president. He's, he's boorish, he's bombastic, he's slightly narcissistic, to be fair, but, you know, People overlooked his faults because he was promising change. And the thing with Trump is once Trump makes a promise, he generally keeps it. That's how he's established himself as a businessman. He's kept his word at every turn. Clinton has not. I mean, Obama demonized her in 2008 for lying about being shot at by snipers in Sarajevo. And there was actually a very good video, but I'll send it to you later on, about how... Um, about how Obama absolutely lampooned her in 2008 and then said she was the best person in 2016. Looking, <laughs> my, how the worm turns. Well, the American people, they had the, the final word on Hillary Clinton. They decided not to elect her as their president, which is probably uh, the, uh, the, the satisfying end that we should uh, conclude today's show so thank you uh michael for coming on again and uh discussing the the week's events uh we we've just done a live stream but we'll we'll definitely do another live stream for uh super by election uh saturday thank you tim all right everybody that's the show for today please join us for the next major event coming up in melbourne which is the no snowflakes pub night hosted by avi yemini and sydney watson it is on friday the 1st of june and will be held in the south yarra area tickets are free and can be booked via eventbrite it's also your last chance to book tickets for the a jew muslim and christian walk into a bar event featuring avi yemini imam tawidi and kiralee smith with professor james allen as the devil's advocate it is this thursday the 17th of may at 7 p.m at the mount gravitz bowl club in brisbane and sydney and melbourne events will be announced shortly also don't forget if you want to take the unshackled even further and score some awesome rewards in the process please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash the unshackled also don't forget we have our online store upright market where you can purchase unshackled merchandise and other gear for right thinking people so thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time 
Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.